We traveled a long ways to get back to where we started from about 19 years ago. Right back where we, we started, started from. from. It's been a nail biter. What boat will we get? What just happened? Oh no! Colossal waste of guacamole. All right, about time we let you in on what we're up to. I'm a little scared, but there's a quote I like that says, if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. Buying a boat is an emotional experience. Will it be as nice in person as in the pictures? What if we don't get it? And what if we do? Because this is a big deal. This is a relationship that will last for years. First impression on the boat, so I got this boat dress. It's right up here at the corner. Oh, okay. See that really tall mass right there? Oh, <laughs> see that? Okay. Well, here we are. Oh. Whoa, she looks big. <laughs> wow. Oh my god. Wow. Oh my god. Holy crap. This could be it. It's really big. It is really big. <laughs> okay, I, I think it's wager time. Well, <laughs> we'll go out for some day sales and get a handicap figure out. <laughs> Did you say this seems really familiar? Yes, the cobblestone, all the wet stones and grass and Everything got washed clean in the night. I love that. I don't know if it got washed clean. <laughs> All right, tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what you're feeling. Feeling nervous, but excited. This is a very big moment. I feel like uh, it's gonna feel good. That's my prediction. This is so familiar. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. Wow, man. Are we here? <laughs> Am I delirious? After so much talk and dreaming and travel, we are here. We're at, uh, we're at Javelin. We're at Chris White's Atlantic 55. Welcome to Javelin, a Chris White Atlantic 55. Little bum that Chris couldn't be here with us, but also nice to have free run of a boat for a couple days and really take a good peek around. This is probably where we were ruined and decided we had to move to something like Chris White's boats. This forward cockpit makes so much sense for so many different reasons. First of all, safety-wise, you're a long ways from the edge of the boat. I mean, it's gotta be, what, 12, 14 feet? Within about eight feet or so, you have got all of your controls, all of your sail handling. 
All the reefing is done from here. Halyards run here. The daggerboard controls are right here. And so from a safety standpoint, just knowing you don't have to leave this cockpit in case, unless there's just some sort of crazy problem, it's a lot of peace of mind. These are Anderson winches and they are excellent quality. No, we're not sponsored by Anderson. We had these on low pressure, but we didn't have an electric winch. This is a huge upgrade for us. Nick, where are the dagger boards? I don't see them popping up. They're hidden. It's a unique design on this Atlantic 55. You don't have dagger boards integrated into the decks the way you do on other performance boats. Instead of the dagger boards sliding up and down, these swing. If you collide with something, that dagger board will swing up and hopefully not break. The up and down type of dagger boards, they often will shear off or break the dagger board trunk. But with this boat, it'll just slide right on by. We've got electronic throttles. The, these throttles are duplicated in the inside steering system and it's all fly-by wire. That's something that's new for us. But yeah, you can control the boat, the engines from outside or inside. I know what you're thinking. You're gonna get cooked out here in this exposed cockpit. But the truth is, when the sail is up, you have your instant sunshade. You just move over here if the sun's over there. When you're at anchor, we've got a shade that will come over the cockpit. So we're covered. Check out these beefy arms. These arms swing aft and the dinghy, when you're at anchor, just hangs over there. So you have your entire cockpit free. The best part about this system here is when you're underway. The dinghy is securely stowed on the aft deck and you don't have to worry about it getting filled with water or falling off in rough seas. You notice these poles? Well, this is for rigging up an aft shade. It covers the entire back deck here, so you're protected from the sun. I think we're gonna need like four to six bean bags. I definitely can't call it a cockpit, but behind the aft deck, we find access to the front of the engines and the rudders, as well as the steering system. The rudders are mounted pretty far back in the sugar scoops. It's got cable steering, but the autopilot is hydraulic. It's NKE. I had to do some research, but evidently a very well-respected brand. Bridge deck clearance on a high-performance boat like this is pretty important, and I believe we're looking at about three feet of clearance on Javelin. Wind generators, no go. This will be the first thing that we lop off the back deck. Um, it's only got two 330 watt panels. It's got AGM batteries. A lot of room for improvement on this boat or updating, upgrading. Chris, I love your simplicity. You've got the anchor mounted on the crossbeam. On Clarity, we had it mounted on the bridge deck and it was much more complicated to deploy. I don't love this netting. It's not quite as comfortable as Clarity's, but it's a performance boat and the water needs to be able to spray through and not get bogged down. I really like the safety features that Chris has designed into this boat. You'll notice that there's actually two head stays. I'm sure there are proper names for the forward one and the aft one. It's almost like we've got an inner fore stay. In essence, we have two head stays, both with furling drums. One is for a working jib, and that runs off of this jib boom. The jib boom is what helps to control the sail shape allowing us to use less sail to get the same amount of power. Less sail is a safety feature. Putting up too much sail to drive the boat is not good for the rig, it's less stable, and it's less comfortable. Because we've got two head stays, either one of these could fail and the mast would not topple backwards. Traditional rigging on a catamaran has only the aft sweeping shrouds and then a head stay to counteract those forces. There's another margin of safety here on this boat. <sighs> Get out of that hot sun and relax. I love this saloon. There's no galley to clutter up your living space. You got two huge couches where you can relax and look around and see everything that's going on. 
I can set up a yoga class for at least three people in here when it's rainy outside. I'm just picturing being underway. Like, this is a good spot. <laughs> nice views. Hey, I'll keep watch. Go ahead and take a nap. How many people can we fit here? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Pull up another chair. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's a party. <laughs> Since we're not retired, we need to be working. I guess we're called digital nomads. And this is an amazing workspace. You can have multiple laptops going, camera gear, all in one spot. And I can't tell you how important that is because there's a lot of hard drives and a lot of cords that we're always trying to organize. Well, many things distinguish a Chris White design from really any other sailing catamaran. But one of the big ones, of course, is the forward cockpit with the inside helm, the inside steering station. Being able to control the boat, the autopilot functions, the navigation functions, and even the throttles from up here inside is a big plus for us. The engine controls are handy, and we still got great visibility forward. We can see the sails, and if we need to make an adjustment to the sails, it's a quick trip right out through the door. The electronics are, the electronics are pretty old. Um, the boat did have a lightning strike uh, last year, so Chris has been changing a lot of that out. Um, he's been doing the work himself, which I don't know how he's been doing it because it is really hot down here. Watch your step. The stairs are more like a ladder, and at first I thought, I'm not going to like that. I want to walk forward. But the truth is, you always need to be holding on when you go downstairs anyway. And the handhold here and the handhold here is great. There are two camps in this world, galley up or galley down. And I used to be a galley up girl because I could see everything that was going on in the cockpit and I could be a part of the conversation. But what I love about this galley down is not only can I still see what's going on in the salon, I have way more space. Probably my favorite feature though is the refrigerator and freezer at eye level. <laughs> I can't tell you how much of a pain it was to get down on my knees and try to efficiently and quickly find that thing I needed. Another thing I love is all of the storage. You think, what's in this tiny little cabinet? Look at this, all of your dishes. I have these dishes. What? <laughs> no, you don't. I really do. You brought these with you. No, this is not a plant. What? Oh my God, what are the chances? They have very good taste. <laughs> and I have these cups. What's going <gasps> on here? Do, 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 do. <laughs> no, I love all the storage in this galley. I got it up here, eye level, and down below, I can keep all my pots and pans and food really organized. Now the inverter is kind of noisy on this boat. It's old style, so I think I'm going to go ahead and turn off the inverter. Whew, it is getting hot. Right here we've got one of two electrical panels. This boat is wired a little different than most traditional catamarans in that we've got two separate house banks. There are also two electrical panels. Here are the battery isolation switches, and then we've got the distribution here. First, we've got the 12 volt, then we've got the alternating current, the 120, if you will, at 60 hertz. The inverter and the battery monitoring systems are, they're old. Now, you, these will probably have to be replaced simply because we need more power. Ooh, Must I go? got him, <laughs> but he got me, or he got somebody. <laughs> yeah, we need all the breeze we can get. Woo. This is a uh, four cabin, two head boat. It's, uh, well, it's enough space for about eight people if you're good friends. This is the aft berth. Underneath here is one of the two engines. Probably not my first choice for engine access because if you did have somebody staying in this berth, you'd have to disrupt them to do the engine checks. And I check on the engines 
pretty much every time we go someplace. The engines? Well, we're pretty familiar with these Yammars. We've got mismatched sail drives, though. I'm gonna have to ask Chris why that's the case. Engine hours are a little bit on the low side for a boat of this age, about 1,700 hours on each side. There is a lot of room in the engine compartment. You do have to go around and access through the deck to get to the front of the engine. Notice, it's pretty clean here on Javelin. Also interesting, on this engine, we've got electronic throttle and transmission controls. So everything is fly-by-wire, if you will. This is the box that controls the servo mechanisms that shift us into forward and reverse, and also sends the direct linkage to the throttles as well. Welcome to our master suite. I love this little bench here where I can sit down, get undressed, get ready for bed. I've got storage here. I climb up here. I've got my fans. I got my hat. <laughs> And I can just go to sleep. <sighs> Alright, so here's the head. Nice and bright and also very large. Got a huge storage unit back here for all of our toiletries, sheets, and then we step into the head and the shower. It's very large. A privacy shade. A dry head. <laughs> here's something different than clarity. We've got to manually drain the shower stuff. Well, if the bow was inverted, that's how you get out. That's the escape hatch for the uh, underside of the bridge deck. It's interesting to note that Chris White doesn't even have a life raft on board. It's been said time and again that the safest place to be with a with a vessel that's still floating is with the vessel. That makes a lot of sense. You skip all the weight and you skip on something that probably wouldn't do much for you in most scenarios anyway. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I might still go with a raft. What do you think? I'm not sure either because getting into a raft in rough seas is going to be challenging. And if the boat's still floating, you're going to want to stay on the boat. Should we go take a look at the other side? Let's do it. It's a mirror image of the starboard side with a couple notable exceptions. Things that we really appreciate about this boat. Pretty steep, but again, with the handholds, it works great. Starting aft. Aft is our stand from. I love these little benches. And then you have a nice double-sized berth with plenty of storage behind the door and in these cabinets. Man, oh man. Here's the thing about Chris White boats. They're really designed for sailors, designed for experienced cruisers. Things that you really won't appreciate until you've actually done some miles. And one of those things is a dedicated workbench area. In previous iterations, every time I'd have a project, which is what, every other day, I'd have to drag all my stuff out from under a locker or in a locker inside of a Tupperware or something like that. This space is dedicated to the work materials that I need and it's a workspace where I can actually get a little dirty. I can make a mess and not have it be spread across the kitchen table or out across the cockpit. But having this area with literally lockers full of glues, adhesives, epoxies, tapes, wires, uh, all sorts of tools, it is absolutely critical. And the fact that it's organized into these different compartments will help me to do the projects better and faster. Forward of the work area is another guest suite. Looks exactly like the one on the starboard side. I'm in the port forward shower area. Again, we've got a curtain to keep the head dry. I just want to point out a couple things unique to this design. One is we've got multiple crash compartments, bulkheads separating the main living space from watertight compartments. Or, well, they're watertight until you have a puncture. Let's say you ran into something. You don't want to flood each compartment. So by separating them, you'll limit the damage and the possibility of taking on more water. 
forward of here, we've got sail storage, we've got uh, storage for paddle boards and dinghy wheels and all your normal cruising, I was gonna say garbage, cruising gear, cruising gear. Ah, uh, I know why Chris mounted the water maker down here in the bilge. The less distance you've got to push that water, that seawater, up to the membrane, the less power the water maker is gonna use. Unfortunately, it means that all of the filter changing, all of the, I don't know, access to the water maker is down on your hands and knees, and I'm very much over it. So this water maker is antiquated, it's undersized, and I've already got a couple ideas about where I can put a bigger water maker without causing any problems in terms of power consumption. Not so much ducking on this boat. Plenty of headroom, both in the salon. Saloon? Salon? We still never got a definitive answer there. Let's just go with salon. It's a little tight for me going up and down from the salon to the holes, uh, but it's absolutely workable. Look at that. Oh, yeah, okay. We got our breakers. Got the brains. Yeah, we got, yeah. And, you know, what What I do when I'm looking at boats is I, I go into lockers almost first, I mean, before anything else. There's not much light in here, but this boat, the way it's built, most, most production boats are built as hulls, and then they drop in these modules for the living spaces, like your bathrooms are a separate module, and then they drop the deck on top. And that's, that's how pretty much all the builders do it. A custom boat like this is built way differently. Here's an example. So this is, you know, the main forward transverse bulkhead. And, you know, you don't ask about whether this boat is tabbed or the bulkheads are tabbed. They're all one piece. So it's just a completely different, different thing. Now, again, the boat is 20 years old, so I don't want to make it seem like there's just there's no flaws i mean we found some cracking here and there in point load areas and stress areas so there's definitely things we have to like investigate okay here here would be a good example it's not going to show up very well but here we are at a corner and the fairing is cracked so it can either be a structural problem or it's just filler that is too thick for how much this actually flexes so there's stuff that you're gonna find. Here's another one right here. There's, there's one over here. Yeah. And this is this is not uncommon with boats that don't have any sort of liners, you know, on your FPs and your leopards and all that. All this is, would be covered with some sort of fabric liner, so you would never see yeah. the structural things at all. That's all wine and roses with this boat. Absolute perfection from bow to stern. There's nothing to worry about, nothing to be concerned about. I think we just write a check and sail away. What do you say? I think we could leave tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's never the case. Uh, this boat is almost 20 years old. And while it's a fabulous design, the choices that Chris has made are just perfect in almost every way. She is showing signs of age. It's showing up in a couple different spots. First of all, in the finish work. We hope it's just finish work. Mm -hmm. There are areas of the boat that have some interior cracking. Now, most likely what the case is, is that when they fared or made smooth the inside of the boat, and by the way, the fairing job on this boat is amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't see any ripples, any undulations, any sand marks or scuffs nothing but they probably used quite a bit of fairing compound to get it that smooth and in some spots it looks like it's maybe flexed more than it can handle and that fairing has cracked so there are some cracks in the finishes around the boat yeah so determining whether or not there are any structural cracks that will be the next step i'm guessing because this is chris white's own boat that he is intimately familiar with every little fissure that has appeared on the boat over time, and that if there were any structural issues, I'm betting that he would have already addressed them. That's one of the beauties of this boat, is that we get to talk directly with Chris White himself, because he does know this boat so intimately. Yeah, um, 
this, another Chris White owner here in the marina said to us the other day, he said, you know what the best thing about a Chris White boat? It's Chris White. This is a guy who has been around boats and multi-holes for decades. He has designed and overseen the construction of some really, really fabulous boats. And his design ethos is around building a boat in a way that it lasts. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we have come to appreciate having had a production boat for the last six years mm -hmm. or so. Yeah. This boat is not only built to sail around the world, it's built to last for over 50 years. So in that way, she's only 19. Yeah, <laughs> she's just a teenager. We know there's gonna be some upgrades to do, things you would wanna do anyway when you get your own boat. Some electronics, some extra solar, a new water maker, things like that we're willing to do. Yeah, all of these add up. And because this is not our first rodeo, we are more realistic about how much it'll cost to do these upgrades. So now that we've seen the boat, I love it. I know, we feel so at home here. And there's some things that, like the salon cushions, you know I have to do. <laughs> These are fine. They're, they're definitely fine. And it's funny because the color reminds me of low pressure. We yeah. had that emerald green going on. Yeah. So I don't hate it, but I just feel like I want to brighten it up. And of course, I want to do my own, you know, personal touches. But I do love the cushions. Yeah, yeah. And then in terms of systems, I think what I'm going to have to do is sit down with a spreadsheet or maybe we can do that together and really itemize things and get a budget together that's realistic because this boat will stretch us financially. And the last thing you want to do is get in over your head and then not be able to do the things for the boat that you know you need to do to do the mission that you want to do. Mm -hmm. So since we're headed across the Pacific and around the world, there are quite a few upgrades that aren't really optional. And figuring out how to do that is something we still got to take care of. A lot of spreadsheeting left to do. Obviously, we could go a whole lot deeper with our analysis of this boat. And we actually did and shared it with our patrons <laughs> earlier. So if you'd like to get more behind the scenes details, stuff that I don't know, maybe isn't of interest to the entire audience. Join up on Patreon for as little as uh, about $2. Yeah, you can actually choose how much you want to support us with, but we really appreciate it. And actually, it's the reason that we can do this and share it with the world is because of our patrons. Yep. Patrons, you're making this show possible. Yep. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.